Hi, my name is Travis Landers. Today we're going to be getting our hands dirty in a little bit of language learning. I've been playing around with three different languages. I'm not fluent by any means, but I feel like these experiences can better inform my teaching. They can help me kind of understand where my ESOL students are coming from, and hopefully they can help you understand where ESOL students are coming from too. I'll be comparing and contrasting the different methods I used and the different languages. Uh, I use things like online learning, traditional approaches like books, what's a book? And I also am going to throw in some advice from the experts. So let's get linguistic! For my linguistics course, we were asked to study a language for six half-hour sessions, totaling three hours. First, we did a written reflection on the experience. And today, I'll be finishing that project by making this video and showing off what I've learned. At first, I thought about covering Korean. 안녕하세요, Travis입니다. 사랑해요. Travis, 그, 나는, 쟤는, 어, 10년 동안 한국에서 살았어요. 살고 있습니다. 어, 한국말 조금 알아요. 그, 많은 단어 배웠어요, 옛날 때. 근데 지금은 영어 그렇지기 때문에, 영어 수업 때문에. So as I was saying, I almost tried to do Korean, but then I thought it's kind of cheating a little bit. Well, I'm by no means fluent. I already know a fair bit of Korean, and it kind of, you know, choosing Korean kind of misses the major point of the assignment. I wanted to try a language that was completely new to me, so I could really hone in on the feelings and experiences a new language learner goes through. I hoped I could get a better sense of my ESOL student's perspective, and perhaps use this information to better inform my teaching. I'll touch on my experiences with Korean more in my final thoughts though, as you know they're a huge part of who I am and I wanted to share this at the beginning of the video to get it kind of out in the open. For my assignment I ended up choosing to cover Russian though, uh, for many reasons. First of all, it sounds awesome. Not only does the language itself sound awesome, but the Russian accent of English sounds awesome, uh, so I just was drawn in by that. Second, I assumed there would be some shared words between English and Russian, and I liked this idea as a facet of my experiment. With limited time on my hands, I chose to use a free online site called Duolingo.com. Without time to really learn the alphabet, I chose to study using the romanization of the language. After my six half-hour sessions, this is roughly what I could say. Ya Trebis. Good year, moi bagaza. Moi bagaza tam. Eto moi bagaza. Ani pure ta eto moi bagaza. Good yeah, my coffee. Not too bad, right? For a free resource, I thought Duolingo was pretty cool. I think you should check it out. Um, however, the assignment had asked me to introduce myself and tell what I liked, where I lived, uh, what I wanted to eat. And although some of these things were touched on in Duolingo, I didn't quite get far enough to see all of those things. Perhaps it's in future lessons. I'm not sure. I ended up supplementing my learning with a bunch of different online sites and YouTube videos. I had to poke here and there to kind of get what I wanted. I wrote it out in English first and then tried to, you know, translate it and figure out what these words were. Oh man, my tabs were completely jammed pack. I thought my Explorer, I don't use Internet Explorer, but I thought Chrome was going to explode. And after a few more hours of studying, 
I could say something like this. Привет. Меня зовут Трэвис. Я зову Векария. Это мой дом. Это мой дом, а не мой дом. Мне нравится. Мне нравится слышать музыку. Мне нравится яда. Мне нравится фрукты. Я ем яблока. Яблока. Я ем яблока. Я ем яблока. А не багаза. В Корее мне нравится джимдок, гимбаб, эджонгук, шабу-шабу. Мне нравится готовить. Хочу Поезит в Реся. Спасибо. Спасибо. Sweet. I had learned a smidge of Russian. Русский. But more importantly, I had felt what it was like to be a clueless language learner again. I wanted to try more. I thought about how I could make the experiment even richer. That's when I decided to try a different language than Russian that would have little borrowed words and possibly a completely different grammar structure. I didn't know going in, but this is kind of what I assumed and what I was hoping for. Uh, I also wanted to experiment with a different method instead of the online language tool at Duolingo.com. With Pimsler's program, I took a completely different approach. First, I read the instruction guide, with, which gives some very interesting background information on Dr. Paul Pimsler. I will touch on that later in my final thoughts, but I want to learn more about him. The guide also suggests how to use the system correctly, which is pretty invaluable, I feel. I only wish that I would have had actually a little bit more time to play around with Pimsler's uh, series. Although I did get to practice with it, I didn't get to do the same thing as I did with the Russian and Duolingo. Russian and Duolingo, I practiced for about three hours, and with Pimsler's, I could only get in about two hours, really. Unfortunately, I just didn't have the time to make the video and practice and do everything the way I really wanted to do the way life works sometimes and uh, as I'll touch on in a second I didn't actually have the time to follow what they mentioned in their guidelines which is do one um, one unit a day and then take a break and the next day do another unit I couldn't space it out like that I just didn't have enough time you know that's just the way things work out sometimes still I feel like I did get a lot of information from this activity I feel like there's stuff I have to share so I'm gonna do that now and what, what does it all mean how could this help you as an ESL teacher um, you know I feel like the ideas I'm gonna touch on about learning a new language you could use this as a teacher uh, but then again you could also use it if you're a learner of a second language as well uh, a lot of the concepts are really meant to just steer you towards the right material. I'm going to compare these two tools, uh, Duolingo and Pimsleurs, but really I'm going to be using this discussion to bring up concepts about what I feel every language learning system needs to consider. 
Of course, the biggest reminder this project serves to remote is that we must remember who we are serving. Slowly, education is coming around to what I personally hold near and dear to my heart, and that is a servant leadership style of running the classroom, where the learner's opinions are taken into consideration first. Learners are first in my book. They are customers, uh, if you prefer an analogy. If you don't like that analogy, I'm sorry. That's the first one that came to mind. And you know, ESL students have so much going on with them. We have to consider what our customers need and want. Any student has a lot that makes them the special person that they are. And we've got to think about things like their family situation, economics, etc., etc., etc. It's just, it, there's an infinite amount of possibilities that come into play to make each and every one of us the special person we are. We need to have a patient and gentle hand when we're navigating this diverse landscape. By becoming a lost language learner, you know, I was able to kind of renew my humility and respect for learning a second language. Um, this reminder is of dire importance if I'm going to be the best I can for my students. So the real question is, you know, how do we become the best? Well, for me, step one is being a servant leader and remembering how difficult it is to learn a language so I can have patience and understanding. This project helped me refill my reserves of patience. So I'm grateful for that. The issue of patience versus, uh, I guess you would call it a punishment. It's been a constant hurdle for me uh, personally because, you know, I come from a work hard, sink or swim type of background. Uh, single parent family, extremely short. Yes, short people get flack. That's why there's this thing called the Napoleon complex. We didn't invent it. I mean, we there's a reason for it, okay? Uh, I was a wrestler, played a ton of sports lower than middle class income. I guess what I'm trying to say here is I felt the pressures of society and I worked through these pressures, you know, and I'm still working through them. And so it's it, this whole experience has definitely shaped me into a get it done at all costs kind of guy. Um, and that's the way I was at the beginning of my teaching career. Maybe I was pushing a little bit too hard. You couple this with a very goofy, uh, loose, liberal, fun side, and you have, I guess, me in a nutshell. I'm like a hard-working goofball, if that makes any sense. I'm the hardest-working clown in the show business, okay? Uh, my goofy and fun side would have these, you know, times where I'm letting it all loose, and then suddenly there's a flare-up of the angry side, when I didn't feel like my students were doing uh, or putting as much into the project or learning as I thought they should be. So we're all having fun, then suddenly, I'm mad. Um, there's a lot less of that going on these days, but when I look back at my teaching experiences, that's what was happening. And, you know, the hard knocks, the hard nose pushing, it's not the best strategy for dealing with everyone, especially ESOL, where people need to feel comfortable. Uh, I found that a lighter, more sensitive touch works wonders. And that's where my first tip comes in from this language learning experience. How to be a better learner, a teacher for a second language. Have the patience to be a servant leader. You know, get people excited about learning. Have fun, and they're going to have fun too. Choose ex activities that are interesting for both you and your students. Try to see things from their point of view. And these are broad strokes that are hard to kind of figure out. It's hard to like give a one, two, three about this, but it's definitely a tip you need to get to the heart of because being a servant leader, I feel, has really changed my whole outlook on teaching. Uh, speaking of things from a student's perspective, I would like to bring up a piece of advice I got from a polyglot YouTube video a while back, and this kind of speaks to being a servant leader in a way. Polyglots are people who attempt to learn multiple languages at one time, and 
a while back, you know, before I, my current master's program, which is focused on ESOL, and the reason I'm making this video, before all this learning, um, I be, was beginning to make another push to study Korean. I've done it a few times, and I began to think about what, what am I going to do this time? You know, what would be useful? And then I decided, you know, I've got to learn how to learn. I have, you know, I need some strategies. I have no idea what I'm doing here. So I got online and I searched out a bunch of different polyglots, such as uh, Luca Lampariella. Not going to pronounce that right, sorry. Loki2504, that's his username on YouTube. Moses McCormick. Uh, there was a gentleman named Michael Urad. Um, Steve Kaufman. Uh, Michael was writing a book about all these people and it had some interviews and stuff that he was doing. So yeah, I'm studying these polyglots and a bunch of a bunch of different ones as as far as well as the ones I mentioned. And you know, I've listed all these people in the in the show notes. So if you're interested, you should definitely check this out. It's very interesting. Um, I listed some of their channels and I listed some of the videos that I liked of theirs. But uh, anyway, so Steve Kaufman, one of these polyglots, uh, he said he made the comment that you know you got to do what works for you when you're learning a language. And I think this is, again, a super vague comment, but it reinforces the fact that the, the learner is king, not the teacher, not the system. Uh, although this comment is vague, it does have a lot of wisdom, and I feel that it speaks to what I feel the word finesse really is in life. Finesse is, you know, life, finesse, it's walking the line. Life is full of these fine line situations where it takes a little bit of this and that right thing of that and the certain mixture together to get things done. When the two, three, four, or five different things meet, you get success. The degree of your success depends on the timing of these combinations. Too much of one ingredient at the wrong time and the recipe is spoiled. A lot of things are such a delicate balance, and we need to respect that. The reason there is no one system that really gets it right for language learning is because the recipe is constantly changing, and uh, we're struggling to keep the equilibrium, and we're also cooking to a bunch of other people to keep this cooking analogy going. If the system is great for one particular learner right now, in a month it might be boring or less useful to them. It could be boring to their neighbor uh, right now, but interesting to them. So, you know, Steve, in the video in the show notes is the one video where I got it from, so you can check it out as well. He listed uh, other polyglots who were translating, doing various other techniques. Um, and he just kind of came to the point that these techniques don't work for him, but they work for, for them, so why not? You know, it's about interest level and keeping the ball rolling in the learning process. It takes a lot of energy to stay motivated, and, you know, I think that's half the battle. I always try to create some creative space for my students, and it's hard in Korea especially because they've been – and this is a big stereotype, sorry, but it seems like Korean culture has kind of stripped away that creative space for kids. And I get kids that somehow they, they haven't had that time, and so it's hard for them sometimes, but I do create the space and struggle through it with them because I think it's important. And the, in the end, they enjoy it. They enjoy the creative space uh, instead of being told what to do all the time. To be perfectly honest, you know, doing what makes you happy, it's part of it, but it's not all of it. As I said, it's a recipe, and for me, another strong part of the process is the process itself. So, yes, you know, we need to be servant leaders and, and get it right for our students, but I want to also be efficient and he make things head in the right direction. This is where I feel my second tip for language learning and teaching comes up. You got to have a plan. You got to have a plan. Uh, have, having fun is good, but it also needs to be meaningful. Putting these two together is 
possible, but I think it takes a lot of thought. And that's what our job is today. That's what I see my, my job as. Tip number two, have a plan. Use some science. Get educated about being educated. But choose the style that lends to what you are interested in. Mix it. I would like to frame the rest of my thoughts for this video around the dichotomy of having a scientific plan in conjunction with personal interests and motivation. For me, the three languages and many systems I've used and I'm summarizing today, uh, they can all be you know, put together and thought of pretty well using these two areas. So I'm gonna use them. From a scientific approach, I am not really sure where this Duolingo is coming from. So we'll go ahead and start with science. Uh, I have to admit, you know, I, it reminded me of Rosetta Stone. I tried years back and I was not a huge fan of that either. Um, and I'm a little bit not a fan of Duolingo and I'll get to that in a second, although I do like it. If you look around on their site, you'll notice that they do list different folks who are contributing to certain modules and you know that got me wondering do these contributors have a set format and then the admin kind of just said hey do this translate this and this is the program or what's going on I'm not really sure how informed is the content choice for this program on Duolingo why do they choose to cover certain concepts that they do that really made me wonder after doing some studying on Duolingo.com, you know, uh, and then I went to this assignment that we had to introduce ourselves, I wasn't even close. I didn't have any of the information I needed to introduce myself. And that really, really bummed me out. Basically, you can't jump around on their program. And I'm just wondering, like, where, where did, was all of the... Where was all the, the language for personal introductions? Uh, why did they choose to teach certain words and phrases first before this? And why are they locking me out from jumping around if it's free? There were several shared nouns taught at the beginning, for example, like actor, cafe, coffee. The accent's just a little different uh, in Russian, but they are shared words, cafe. Coffee. You know, I, I don't know if I'm hitting the pronunciation. I need to listen a little bit more, but that's the way I remembered them. Why? You know, great. But why would you teach these words to me? How can they help me get immersed and into the language, really into it? I just kept thinking this as I'm, I'm going through these shared words. For, for This is one example of why I, I didn't care for Duolingo's approach. When I studied Korean as a kind of other point of view here. Um, the most headway I made was a university course. And in that course, they taught us 30 basic verbs, past, present, future conjugations. After that semester, I was prepared to go out and get into the language. I could go up to people, I could ask questions, I could talk about most anything because these were the basics come, go, put, close. You know, it prepared me to play, and that's what I'm looking for as a learner. Back to tip two, you know, you got to have your learner in mind. That's what I want. I want to go out and play. I want to get involved, and just sitting in front of a screen, it gets boring after a little bit, although I did kind of enjoy the process that they had going on. I'll touch, touch on that a little bit more later. So I have super mixed feelings about Duolingo where I feel like the content was eh, but the process was uh, and uh, 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 uh. Um, yeah. Pimsler's was a little bit better as far as content. The first lessons dealt with phrases like, you know, do you understand Swahili? I am an American. These things I could see you actually, you know, it was situational based. I could see you getting into the situation where you bump into somebody who's Swahili and this is what, this is what they're going to say, you know? So I felt like Pimsler's has the edge as far as choice of content words is concerned. They it seemed more useful. 
it didn't ha- it also didn't help me do my personal introduction but it was useful and it kind of gets me to, to wonder because both of them failed in this personal introduction assignment go make a personal introduction what do i have to do i have to search around everywhere to find little bits and pieces it, this gets me to wonder like how can language programs give the learner more choice and become more personal uh, because this is what they need to do i feel like going back to my tip number one learners number one none of these online programs really do that they don't ask you what your goals are it doesn't seem like and structure things around that it seems like a program would have done that by now tip for all you developers out there you know enter in my i want to do this there's the lessons you should work on automatically those focus on those first or focus on this first which gets me to that lesson you know if it was a directed stair step it'd even be better so i'm just wondering where is that at where it can be directed and and it can suit all languages but still be flexible enough to give me the creativity i need to choose what i want to learn because i mean i am learning at home by myself it's not like i'm going to be destroying it for the rest of the class There's no argument there. Continuing on the topic of science, I was really taken away by the introduction to the program Pimsleurs provides. If you read their guidebook, they describe how to use the program. They describe the philosophy behind it. For example, they talk about how it uses a memory theory called graduated interval recall. And here's a quote from that. It says, this program is carefully designed to remind you of new information at the exact intervals where maximum retention takes place. Each time your memory begins to fade, you will be asked to recall the word. And they do repeat the words a lot. And man, it makes a lot of sense. It sounds awesome. I love the use of science about the brain, psychology, etc. to better inform my teaching and my learning. My only hope is that one day, you know, educators who actually teach our teachers, uh, the people who instruct teachers, will make some of this stuff a little bit more accessible by mixing it together and and giving us the bites that we need because it doesn't seem like books do that these days. I want to see a mixture of psychology and uh, memory and all this stuff. I'm not seeing it. There has been a lot of progress however and you know Pimsler's is using that science so that's encouraging but uh, I'd like to see more I'd like to see more of it Uh, there's the bell sorry about that on Duolingo however you know I was left to wonder if this has any real scientific backing at all what is the foundation for this web apps approach it just didn't seem like there was anything and if there is they're not sharing it openly enough uh it's a free program so i I say why not share it you pay for pimsler and they're giving away their secrets i'd like to know what what they based their their content choice on and the the different activities they're doing um so again it seems to me that pimsler wins out (laughs) it's just more rooted in scientific reasoning than duolingo and it, it kind of has this memory theory a couple other theories working for it whereas duolingo i just i don't know they don't say anything so i'm assuming nothing i'm still unsure how much science is really there in spite of its popularity though uh the guide in pimsler also describes a concept called the principle of anticipation which it claims will create novelty and accelerate learning you know despite the popularity of this program I have yet to read anything about Pimsleur in any of my intro to ESOL methodology classes. I've read, I think, two or three books, never described any of these theories or even mentioned Dr. Pimsleur himself. So, you know, like, is this an oversight? Again, I I go back to this kind of query. Is it the people that are educating ESOL teachers that are missing some things? They need to be you know informing us better about the possibilities out there the research or is it just the fact that maybe his theories are not respected in the academic community the series seems totally respected so i don't get why he's not hmm it could be maybe that 
you know, because it's it's kind of an older model in a way. It's kind of the audio linguistic, I think, uh, that approach. I think that's what it falls in, under. And it doesn't fix everything. Maybe that's the reason that nobody's talking about it, but it's odd to me. It's really odd to me, this oversight. And it interests me a lot. So I'm going to go out and kind of get into him. I want to get some time and check out his theories and who this guy was. Because, uh, you know, it, it definitely is interesting. But I have to put an asterisk next to some of these because is the science better than Duolingo? I'm not really sure. I mean, it says it in the, in the book, but then again, maybe not. One point that seems to be a consensus amongst language learners and teachers is that listening comes before writing and reading. Uh, this is the most efficient. This is how babies naturally pick up language. It makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense. If you listen to some of the polyglots talk, they think similar things. In the video I posted in the show notes from uh, Loki2504, he mentions how he previews... Oh, sorry. He mentions how he prefers to listen a lot to get a feel for the language. And I definitely understand what he's saying here because of the uh, you know, struggles I was having with Swahili and Russian trying to get the pronunciation down. I just felt like I really wanted to listen a lot more. But with a, in the Russian case, definitely. With, with the Russian, I, I just couldn't because the Duolingo program doesn't let you listen as much as the Pimsleur. And I, I, even the short time I did Pimsleur, I got a lot of listening practice in and and I need more. I felt like I needed more even than that. But it was it, it was more. So uh, again, Pimsleur wins out, you know? Like they, in this department, they're pushing for listening before writing way more than Duolingo. Duolingo has snippets to listen to at times, but I, I don't feel like it's enough. Also, Duolingo pushes you to type out answers early on, which is technically writing, and I feel it's just a little bit too early for that. So, Pimsler's, it wins out here too, as far as science goes, and the thought that, you know, we should be listening way before we're reading. Pimsler's is entirely auditory. All these things together make my final thought you know, kind of odd uh, for this experiment. For me, the tool that felt most motivational and interesting, uh, to jump over on the other side of the graph, was Duolingo. You know, it fails in all these scientific areas, but I like it more. I just like the feeling of it. It seemed more fun. Perhaps this is because it's the first thing I tried. Perhaps it's because, you know, I used Pimsleur only like slightly less and to be honest the listening was good but the repetition thing was a little bit much for me it just felt like shotgun too much scatter shotgun or machine gun i guess um it, it, another theory i've been poking around in my head is maybe i liked the duolingo better because i'm more of a visual learner you know like i needed a picture um, i'm not sure so kind of we're to this question which one of these is better uh well again I, you know i think i have to really go back to my first tip and think about being a servant leader thinking about the learner first I have to think about the learner first and what they need you know try to see things from their point of view and i think what it truly means to see things from the learner's eyes if i think about it in this respect Neither one is better than the other, really, because it's going to depend on the learner. In this case, for me, I'm the learner, so it's pretty easy to see my perspective. Um, I would choose maybe to do both of them. And uh, just because I like the variety of Duolingo, but I realize the content and listening, listening is a little bit lacking. Uh, another option in my mind that would work for me, because I know what motivates me, uh, is doing the the Pimsleur first and then like using the thought of doing the Duolingo as kind of like an incentive or a prize after finishing the Pimsleur. Like it might give me more motivation to get through that hard Pimsleur. 
because yeah, like I said, the listening was a little bit too shotgunny. It just didn't fit my style as much as I would have liked it to because it seems really grounded in science. So that would be the way I might handle it for myself. You know, it's it's a shame I feel that Duolingo doesn't include more of like a how to regarding their material. They don't at least in my knowledge, but it's just the way it is. I feel like it could be a really good tool like later on, especially because it's free. Um, and it does incorporate just a little bit of writing. And then I feel like Pimsleur might be a great tool in the beginning. And if they kind of said this just out in the open, you know, try Pimsleur and then jump over to us or whatever, I'd feel a lot more comfortable with Duolingo as far as uh, the logical side of my brain. As a teacher, does this help us? How does this help us? Um, what I guess I'm proposing is first, you need to consider these tips very carefully and use them to you know steer your practice. Find activities that are rooted in true science because those are going to be more efficient and use of time is the biggest enemy we have. The biggest enemy we have in, uh, is being a teacher, I feel, in education. However, you got to remember that just because something is based in science doesn't mean everybody's going to dig it. And it could get boring after a while, you know? Like, you got to make things interesting. I've gone on blabbering on this video. You're probably lost interest by now. I'm not taking you into consideration. Um, but hopefully you sat through it. Uh, so, yeah, I feel like we have to try to recognize when the science isn't working and create opportunities for fun and exploring and then maybe find a different scientific kind of scientifically rooted activity to use at a different point if you have to. It reminds me of TPR. I did a, a video on TPR on this channel. You can find it, Total Physical Response, a uh, perfectly scientific uh, method. You know, people are getting great results out of it. And then it didn't fill the one size fits all, it has to accommodate everything situation that education seems to be stuck in. We need one program to do everything for us. Uh, it didn't fill that. So what happened with TPR was people said, oh, they kind of lost interest in it. And, you know, it, there isn't one thing that's going to do everything for us. We've got to blend and mix some of these ideas and put it into like a, a nice soup. And then when the soup isn't good for one student we got to add some salt to that bowl and then we got to move to the next student and it's hard it's never going to be easy like these systems claim it could be um this is the general or similar con conclusion of steve kaufman too that he lists or that he says in, in his video and i have it listed in the show notes you know and it's just the fact that there is no magic solution. There is no, even when something's rooted in science, there is no system that's going to work 100% of the time for everybody. And you know, on one hand, you could think about this and you could say like, "Oh man, I've got to mix all this stuff and try to accommodate as many students as I can. This is going to be a lot of hard work." You can look at it this way. Or, on the other hand, you could, you know, just enjoy the journey, enjoy the ride, and remember that variety is the spice of life, right? So, which one will you do? Go ahead and uh, leave some comments if you have some thoughts on this topic, and uh, check the show notes for sure. I thank you. Good day. Travis out. Thank you.